Butler stayed in hiding for three months, and though a reward for $500 was offered for information leading to his arrest, he was harbored in various parts of Trinidad and Tobago, and later spirited to Venezuela without detection. As Eric Williams has written, speaks volumes for the unity of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the loyalty to Butler, that no one volunteered to claim the reward. It was a united front of all the workers in the colony, irrespective of occupation and irrespective of race. Butler had become a national hero, and Trinidad and Tobago had received a new political leader. The workers reacted positively and rapidly to the initial strike that had been sanctioned by Butler. While Butler was in hiding, the strike spread rapidly throughout Trinidad. On June 20th, Faisabad flared up again. On the 21st, a crowd of several hundred stoned the police at Point Fortin. On the following day, the workers set up a roadblock to ensure that no vehicles were operative within the strike-bound area. When the workers attempted to enter the refinery with a view to preventing hostile forces from regaining control, three of them were killed by police gunshots and four others wounded. The police were exonerated by the Foster report on the grounds that... The only steps which could have been taken in the circumstances to save the paramilitary police and the refinery. On the morning of 21st June, the working class took over San Fernando where they roamed the business quarter of the town, closing down shops, threatening individuals, and holding up traffic. Later on, they closed down the electricity station in San Fernando. But when the workers attempted to take over the telephone exchange, two more of their number were killed, and eight more wounded. Around 12 noon on the 21st, the sugarcane workers at Houston St. Madeline joined the domestic servants in taking over the factory, the trains, and the staff-occupied bungalows to which they had previously been denied access except as servants. Here they confiscated furniture and household goods. They closed down the electricity and water supply, assaulted and insulted the white company officials who had earlier maltreated them, and left only with the vow to return in the night. In Pinal to the south, five more workers were wounded by police gunfire. Only one policeman was wounded by a stone. On the 22nd of June, the workers at Waterloo and Wyabi Sugar Estates went out on strike. At Woodford Lodge, another worker was killed and two more wounded. On the 22nd of June, at the instigation of Timothy Rudal, the strike spread to Port of Spain, where, like San Fernando of the previous day, Work at all the industrial establishments had ceased. One Port of Spain worker was wounded. Rio Claro on the same day, in an effort to prevent the workers from taking over the oil field at Guayaguayari, five workers were killed and 20 wounded by police gunfire. Two policemen were wounded, one by police gunfire, the other by a stone. Commenting on these killings, the Foster Commission said, we are satisfied that in opening fire initially, the police were justified, for not only were they in imminent danger of being overpowered and disarmed, but they were themselves actually being fired upon. We agree, however, that the continued firing by the police was not justified. But even so, no police were brought to trial. In Dinsley village, two more workers were injured. Indians and Negroes, sugar and oil had united in blood, as well as in effort. In all, 14 workers and two policemen were killed. 59 workers and nine policemen were injured. In all, about 2,000 officers and men were mobilized against the workers. In addition, two warships with 210 officers and men were urgently called to Trinidad from Bermuda. Together, they brought the disturbances to a halt, but the strike continued and Butler remained in hiding, protected by the protesting workers. Throughout the entire drama, the focus was on Butler. He had threatened the strike 
and supported the workers when they took premature action. Rienzi was on the sidelines supporting Butler. And Cipriani, absent from the scene, was on his way home from England, where he had gone to attend the coronation of King George VI. The only one of these three who had the workers' confidence was Butler. Cipriani certainly did not. While he was away, the general secretary of his organization, the Trinidad Labour Party, pledged his party's solid support to quote him for the government. And when Cipriani returned from Buckingham Palace, he stated that, and I quote, it is with great pleasure indeed that I make the definite statement that none of those concerned either directly or indirectly are members of the TLP, unquote. He urged the strikers to use constitutional means to express their grievances. but neglected to point out that the Crown Colony system, which permitted less than 10% of the adult population to vote, provided no constitutional means by which the workers could express their grievances. It was a serious omission on Cipriani's part, and it was this type of posture that caused Butler to dismiss him in the way that he did. And it was Butler's commitment to the total revolutionization of the Crown Colony system that made him, as Williams observed, the hero and spokesman of the working class. Yet the Crown Colony government refused to recognize Butler for what he was. Instead of calling Butler out of hiding to negotiate on behalf of the workers, they hunted him like a common criminal and set up a mediation committee to hear the workers' grievances. They established contact with Butler through Rienzi, who had Butler's complete confidence and became his accredited emissary. In the course of the negotiations, Butler, whose British Empire Workers and Citizens Home Rule Party lacked proper organization, admitted that he could not order the workers back to their jobs. The police took this as a signal to crush the strike, and through a process of intimidation, the strike was broken, and most of the workers returned to their jobs by July 5th, 17 days after the strike had started. In the judgment of Eric Williams, the disturbances of 1937 were a close approximation to a general strike. These strikes and disturbances signal the beginning of mass political consciousness in Trinidad and Tobago and gave the workers the type of self-respect which they had never achieved since leaving Africa and India. This self-respect and self-confidence were the basic requirements for freeing the country from colonial rule. In recognition of the workers' achievements, the governor and the colonial secretary paid unusual tribute to the strikers and their leader. Listen first to the governor. On Butler, His Excellency had this to say. It seemed to me that while Butler was somewhat extravagant in his views, there was sincerity in the man. There was, running through his speeches and through his letters, an undercurrent of sincere appeal. Now, what caused these riots? A Dutch doctor with 20 years' experience in the field told me that he had never seen such distressing conditions as existed amongst the East Indian population, where apparently men and women suffered from a deficiency of all the known vitamins. This was nothing but a total condemnation of the Crown Colony government. Listen to the governor on the racial situation. I am quoting complaints which run through numerous documents and more particularly through all Butler's letters and speeches. The employing class is largely white. The employed almost wholly colored and mostly West Indian. A considerable number of young white men have been taken on in higher posts to the exclusion of the senior colored man. I have just received a report which shows that the attitude of the white employers goes a great deal towards cultivating racial hatred and that fear of the white man was being encouraged instead of respect for the white man. This to my mind goes to the heart of the matter. 
And I am certain that the white employer class in Trinidad will find intact and sympathy a shield far more sure than any forest of bayonets to be planted here. Then there is the red book or service book. The employers tell me that this book is used to ensure that if a man occupies a skilled position, he can command a wage in accordance with his merits. Labour, on the other hand, believes that this book is used to prevent men from moving from occupation to occupation. This was as clear an indication as any of the chasm existing between the black workers and the white employers. On the economic issue, the governor had this to say. We have the fact that the increase in the cost of living has gone up by 17%. That is a large matter for the lower paid men. But in defense of the oil industry, he stated an apparent contradiction. As far as I know, there is no good ground for an all-round increase in the oil industry. Concerning the agricultural workers, the governor revealed that wages have been pressed down. When a man has not got a living wage, he cannot possibly be efficient. He is worried there are debts, rent unpaid, wife ill, a number of hungry children to be fed. Nobody can put in a proper full day's work under these conditions. Now in the urban areas, a very large majority of the 15,000 school children of Port of Spain go, do not get a breakfast in the course of the day. With a refreshing frankness, the governor stated that as far as he was concerned, the Crown Colony government was just as much to blame as anyone else. In a thinly veiled tribute to Butler, His Excellency concluded, I think that the colony has had a salutary purge as a result of these riots, which, given goodwill on both sides, should render the colony more prosperous and more happy. The riots have been a warning to the employers that they should be more generous, sympathetic and patient. The colonial secretary, M. H. Nankiville, agreed when he said that the strikes now permitted Trinidad to enter a new era. Another tribute by the colonial secretary to Butler, the 14 martyrs and the working class. In the past, we've had to salve our consciences with humbug and we have had to satisfy labor with platitudes. These days have gone by. There can be no question today of government, the oil industry, and the sugar industry not being able to pay a fair wage. Only the circumstances of the riots could have permitted the colonial secretary to warn the sugar industry. We must we keep the workers employed, but we must keep them employed in decent conditions and not in conditions of economic slavery. Though the colonial secretary and the governor might very well have been right, Butler was really seeking the overthrow of the Crown Colony system and the substitution of a truly Trinidadian personality, a Trinidadian political culture. But Butler's party was inadequate to the task of achieving these goals. It lacked both proper organization and a functional ideology. To say this and to recognize that both Butler and the 1937 riots fell far short of their goal is not in any way to devalue Butler's tremendous contribution to the awakening of mass political consciousness in Trinidad and Tobago. After the riots, Butler was brought before the court, but Butler did not accept the court's jurisdiction over him. He challenged the legitimacy of the government and questioned the right of the court to try him. In doing so, he proclaimed in typical Butler style, The Butler point of view is that this government, a crown colony form of government, is not constitutional. And furthermore, Butler is absolutely and completely opposed to crown colony government in this day and age. And so, a court that is set up 
by a crown colony government cannot be capable of trying Butler or convicting Butler. I reject any verdict coming from this court. I reject any verdict coming from this court. Even so, he was convicted of sedition and given the maximum sentence of two years imprisonment. He appealed unsuccessfully to the Court of Criminal Appeal of Trinidad and Tobago. But a subsequent appeal to the Privy Council in the United Kingdom was allowed on the grounds that the court which had heard the original appeal was not properly constituted. Butler had been discharged shortly before the Privy Council gave judgment. He had served his two years for no crime. Shortly after, he was rearrested and put in detention because it was feared that he might be a threat to the British World War II effort. He was finally released in 1945. While Butler was in jail, Cipriani was promoted to the Executive Council as a representative of a labor movement that had long rejected him. Rienzi, with authority of Butler behind him, proceeded in 1937 to form and become President General of the Oil Field Workers Trade Union and the Oil Trinidad Sugar Estate and Factory Workers Trade Union. In 1943, Rienzi, like Cipriani before him, was promoted to the Executive Council. Less than nine months later, Rienzi accepted the civil service post of Second Crown Council and resigned from the trade union movement. The colonial secretary, M. H. Nankiville, was sent to another colonial assignment and was replaced by George Linden, another Englishman who became industrial advisor to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The governor, Murchison Fletcher, whose unexpected speech about the workers' grievances, though factual, was described by the Foster Commission as unfortunate and untimely, was persuaded by the colonial office to tender his resignation from the colonial service on the grounds of mental ill health. All these events and circumstances merge into one and contribute to the significance that is June 19th. Labor Day. Today, as we celebrate what I am always pleased to refer to as the Butlerites Thanksgiving Day, I call upon one and all of my warriors to lift their hearts to Almighty God in joyful praise and thanksgiving for the victories, the working class victories, the immortal victories, the epic victories of labor under God and Uriah Butler in the history making days of June 1937. Glory to God in the highest. Long live labor. Long live the servants of labor in Trinidad and Tobago. Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler, the chief servant, was elected to the Legislative Council in 1950. He lost his seat in 1961. As a recognition for his service to the country, he received his country's highest award, the Trinity Cross, in 1970.
forgotten now the dream. Day. Die, die, die.